Thank you. Good afternoon to you. Ah, I forgot the zapper. So we've all seen all these buzzwords going about, you know, AI, machine learning, big data. And if you're in the security space, kind of every startup you see or every security company out there is saying, hey, we're the best because uh, we use AI. Um, or we got machine learning, AI-based advanced threat protection, hyperdimensional security analytics. Believe it or not, that's actually one company's slogan. Uh, complex proactive behavioral modeling, and then simpler ones, next gen, X gen. And then, of course, you get the old Dilbert-style cartoon, the boss, someone like me, sitting there and saying, hey, let's solve this problem by using big data. But what the heck does all of this really mean? Is it real? And why is it that you know, security has existed for 20 or 30 years without all of this kind of AI stuff out there? And if, it, uh, if it's not real, you know, are customers being confused? Are they being led to um, invest in the wrong products? Are investors investing in the wrong technologies? When I go to conferences like this in Israel, for example, there will probably be two or three hundred startups in the audience focused just on security. And I can guarantee you, every one of them is talking AI and machine learning. <clears throat> and I can also guarantee you that out of those 200, at most 10 years from now, one or two will exist. So what does it really mean for security? And in security, the data amounts are huge. So just looking at what we do at Avast, we stop three and a half billion attacks a month. That's 80,000 attacks every second. We stop half a billion visits to malicious websites. We stop 20 or 30 million phishing attacks. And we find 20 to 30 million new executables, EXEs or DLLs uh, in the uh, Windows jargon, uh, every single month of which about a one quarter are actually malicious. So there's a massive amount of data. And how do you sort through it? And we hit the wall many years ago that there was just too much data to process manually. And frankly, pretty much all security companies hit that same wall. So security companies started moving heavily into AI probably about 15 years ago. So all this buzz you're hearing right now about AI uh, it's old. It's been around forever. It's mostly right now marketing buzz. If you're a new company coming into the space, you want to separate yourself from the existing competitors so you come up with something that maybe is perceived as new. But AI has been around for a long time. What's different right now is matching the AI up with data, big data. Uh, and that's where the machine learning comes in. But to really make that work, you need a horrific uh, amount uh, of data. And we're getting to why you got to do that. But first, uh, uh, you, know, you know, there's all this talk about where robots replace people. Can you automatically generate code and replace programmers? I mean, the Japanese were trying that 20 years ago. And in all of this business, there, uh, there are still very, very clear roles. There are many things that people do far better than we can ever imagine computers to do. For example, determining some of the social and political uh, nuances. Many times, attacks and malware, you got to identify them based on some of that social stuff. For example, stuff between Taiwan and China, or between North Korea and Japan. And also things that require deep insight. Uh, you know, one of the very trivial things is um, phishing emails. My wife falls for phishing emails all the time. She's not a native English speaker and you know, phishing emails, uh, they look good. It's difficult to detect phishing emails with, um, uh, with, uh, with software. But uh, you know, for most people, you can just look at the email and there's something that's wrong about it. You, know, you can't maybe put your finger on it, but you just know in your head it's wrong. And those are some of those insights that the human brain has that uh, computer algorithms don't yet have. But machines, obviously, they're far, far faster. They can process a lot more data. They can help handle 
that 80,000 attacks a second that there's no way people can do. You know, for example, in our virus lab responding to threats, we have 50 people. Um, that's small. Most of our competitors have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. But um, even with that, you can't solve it. So if you're looking at AI and machine learning, what are you looking at? First off, you know, your machine learning has to be autonomous. Um, because you're going to be constantly seeing new threats, and it has to figure out for itself what's good and what isn't good. It's got to improve because things in security, things in threats, they change constantly. It's not like the old days. Most of you are pretty young, so you don't remember the old days of uh, on a corner Cova and code and code. Code Red, all these attacks from 15 years ago, they lasted for months and months. Uh, the recent WannaCry, that was a very long-lasting one. I think it lasted for four or five days. Most attacks last for seconds or minutes uh, before they've morphed into something else. So you have to be able to adapt to that. Uh, they got to be safe. These things are making decisions, many times business-critical decisions. And they, um, uh, you know, there's got to be a lot more rigor in the software development. they got to be explainable. And this is difficult because as data sets get more and more complex, how you have the software explain why it said something was good and why it said something was bad is very difficult. And this is probably going to be one of the toughest things to actually do. Um, and then self-defending. Realize security is constantly attacked, and there are very novel ways of attacking AI-based uh, security, especially machine learning uh, uh, security, feeding, uh, feeding it massive amounts of false data, getting a hold of the source code or, um, or um, decompiling the source code so that you can kind of figure out what the AI logic is and how to spoof it. Not hard to do, and it has to be defended against. But when we apply it to security, it's very powerful. But there's really three things that are needed in machine learning uh, coming from Gartner. One is volume, you know, a massive amount of data. Another is velocity, how quickly is that data coming? And then variety, how diverse it is. And what these things, three things really matter in security are that the volume of the data gives us the scalability. If we have a massive amount of data, it means we can support a massive amount of users. And why you need a massive amount of data is security attacks in the olden days would, ta would, ta excuse me, would attack millions of people. Now a security attack may attack 10 people, 20 people, 30 people. So to be able to detect that through machine learning, you got to have a massive volume of data coming in so that you can scale. And velocity, the data's got to come in very quickly, once again, because attacks last for seconds or minutes. Um, so if you don't have, you know, a, you know, not only that huge amount of data, but coming in very quickly to your sensors, you're not getting the data you need to train your machine learning to get the speed to react. And third is a variety of data. You need lots of good data. You need lots of bad data. You need data from all parts of the world, from all different kinds of users, from all different kinds of devices. And because without that, once again, you can't train your, your AI. Now, oops. so this has all been a, um, a, pretty, you know, a pretty difficult problem for what's frankly a pretty simple um, space right now. So if we take the current computing space, ignoring mobiles, you know, like this, uh, and if we look at PCs and Macs out there, Consumer-wise, there's about 1 billion PCs and Macs in the world, just under 1 billion being used by consumers, and about the same number being used by corporations. So we're protecting only about 2 million devices. When we add these things into it, mobiles, 
Um, I think we add another six or eight million, so we're at, uh, we're at about 10 billion. But frankly, you know, uh, the, there's not too much security on these things right now because the devices are very, very primitive and don't have much in the way of security threats. Um, but what we see coming in the future is what everyone's calling the uh, Internet of Things. You know, we're going to have everything connected. For example, in uh, my home in Silicon Valley, um, I think I have 42 devices connected to my home network. Um, now, that's not too uncommon uh, anymore, uh, especially with, uh, with uh, geeks. Um, but if we look, say, five or ten years down the future, that's going to be very common. It could be even, uh, even more. You're going to have connected coffee machines, connected hot water pots, connected microwaves, connected Fitbits, you know, talking on 5G to the cell networks. Your car is going to be connected to your home when you're at home probably to get updates and save over the air bandwidth. You know, everything is going to be connected. And, you know, the current estimate is that it's about 38 billion connected devices in 2020, so just a few years from now. And you know, the security industry, frankly, has a very big problem protecting PCs, which are only 2 billion. Now we're going to basically 20 times more devices and probably far more than 20 times as much data. And these devices don't have computational horsepower. You can't run security on a Fitbit. You can't run security on a coffee machine. You can't run it on a refrigerator. You can't run it on a baby cam, et cetera. And you're going to have to do all of this security in the cloud, looking at the IP stream. And you know, you're, so you're several layers uh, in the stack removed from the end device. And the only way you're going to be able to do security for all of this Internet of Things is really looking at all of those IP streams, figuring out what's really happening. Is this IP stream an attack? Is this IP stream coming out of the baby cam? Is it actually a DDoS, is it actually a DDoS attack against a journalist, which is what happened to Brian Krebs about six or nine months ago. You know, some people didn't like what he wrote. They launched a DDoS attack that, frankly, was sending massive amounts of data from baby cams uh, because home networks are so easy to break into, and um, you know, shut them down. Um, and the only way you're going to protect against all of this is running all your security in the cloud and really running it with a big data ML approach that's uh, looking at all of that data. Now, the challenge, I think, for most everyone in the space is they don't have the data. Uh, it's very, you know, AI algorithms are well known, machine learning algorithms are well known. What's really needed is data. And, you know, without it, there's not too much you can do. Um, thankfully, you know, with us, data is not a problem because we've got like 450 million endpoints, both PCs, Macs, uh, iOS devices, Androids, that we collect all of this data from. We actually run a, um, pretty much all of our security in the cloud these days. Our cloud supports 60 million simultaneous connections. Uh, and all the security for those devices is done through the cloud, most of it through the machine learning. And uh, you know, that generates the tremendous amount of data that you really need for the future. Now, this stuff is um, not easy to understand. You know, basically, what you're doing in the, uh, in the machine learning is you're trying to classify uh, everything that you're seeing. Basically, is it good, is it bad, or in some cases, maybe. You know, malware is obviously bad, clean's obviously good, PUP is industry jargon for a potentially unwanted program. It's a very nice way of saying adware and stuff like that. Stuff that's the legitimate but users probably don't really want. And you're looking at all of these various characteristics uh, in the machine learning algorithm, and you're clustering these things together. You know, this is both known and unknown. Um, and, uh, you know, so if things start having the attributes of something that's known to be bad, your machine learning, you know, um, uh, calls it bad. So you see in this, there's not a whole lot of bad stuff. You've got a few red clusters in there. But uh, that is the whole point of the, uh, of the machine learning. 
How do you take all the characteristics of everything you're seeing, be it uh, websites, be it phishing emails, be it uh, executables, uh, be it just behavior, uh, for example, WannaCry, the companies that did a good job of catching WannaCry caught it through AI. Uh, not any kind of old-fashioned techniques because it was too hard to catch that way. You needed AI to catch it. Um, and you're trying to figure all of that out. And remember, you're doing this, um, in our case, 80,000 times a second. <laughs> yeah, because you know, every second we get 80,000 attacks against our user base that has to run through all of this to determine what's good and what's bad. So to wrap up, you know, AI, ML, big data, it's real. I suspect most of what's being pitched out there is not real just because um, most companies don't have access to data. Uh, and AI and ML, uh, it's the only way we're going to solve security for the future, especially as we move into the Internet of Things. So thank you very much.